Gee whiz, I'm 26 years old and fresh from law school. What area of practice should I concentrate in? Criminal law? Property? Do you want a job helping children? Well, that sounds like a fantastic area. Tell me more. Do you enjoy not being paid? Having parents send you threatening messages what? and emails? Responding to weekly ARDC complaints? Then you should be a guardian at Leadum. Don't care. Want nothing to do with that. You're immune from civil lawsuits. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Sign me right up. For now. Ah, uh So I got sued twice, but that's actually not the worst part of this whole crazy story. First, I, I have to confess something. I wasn't really trying to keep it a secret or anything, but yes, I'm an appellate lawyer, but I also moonlight occasionally as a guardian ad litem. And I even received an award for it a couple years ago. And yes, I take a terrible picture. So how did I get sued? Long end, short end, I was a GAL in a case. There was really no problems until I issued a written report, if you don't know. Uh, GALs, we can issue written reports. They serve merely as recommendations. We are not the judge. The judge can look at a report and kind of tell us to go kick rocks. We're basically just an advisor. So in that report, I had the trameritry to suggest that a parent should have visitation. And the other party, well, they kind of had an allergic reaction to it. And from there, things got crazy. First, he started this blog about me. It has all these really kind of crazy conspiracy theories. I'm not gonna talk about it. It's still there. You can read it for yourself. It speaks for itself. He then review bombed me into the Stone Age. That took like months to clear up. He made numerous complaints to the ARDC, the AG's office, the IRS, the chief judge, the state's attorney, the police, the man on the moon, you name it. We haven't even gotten to the lawsuits yet. Now this person may have been a little bit, I guess, unwell, if you will, but they weren't stupid. They were always careful to sort of touch the line, but not cross over it. So my hands were pretty much tied. And then he uploads this post. It strongly insinuates that he had been in my neighborhood. Now I live in a semi secluded area. It's not a place someone would sort of accidentally drive into. So I got a little creeped out by that. A few weeks later, he shares on his blog an old news story about this activist that went out and killed a cop then fled to Cuba where they don't extradite. And then a few days later, he posts about taking a trip to, you guessed it, Cuba. Now, most of the time, these parental rights advocates are mostly all puff and smoke, but sometimes they go from provocative to outright violent. Take, for example, activist Charles Linderos. I covered him a couple times. He brought a gun to his kid's school because he didn't like how things were going in court and he was killed in a shootout. Then you have Michael McDonald. He's a Nevada father's rights leader. He stalks his ex, catches a DV charge, then stalks the prosecutor who's prosecuting him. So he does a few years in prison. Stephen Westerfield, he was in charge of the Illinois 5050 organization. You know, he recently pled guilty to a domestic violence charge. And of course you have this guy, Cash Jackson. And yes, that's him live streaming his own arrest for threatening to kill not one, but two judges on a recorded line. And he's presently facing six felony charges in Lake County. Now, I have two kids and I'm just not gonna be taking chances with this guy. So I installed multi-layered security. I made significant Second Amendment investments and I did a lot of other things to sort of deter this guy from coming around because you never know how far an angry advocate is gonna take it until they take it. Sadly, my story sort of pales in comparison to the hundreds of other guardian ad litems in Illinois and regretfully, it's now become kind of an occupational hazard to have this happen. Now, I'm gonna get to the lawsuits here in just a second, but first, let me switch out of my normal dad hat and get into my lawyer hat. Okay, back to the legal stuff. As noted, the Father's Rights Movement has made attacking GAL immunity one of their number one platforms for 2022. Now, GAL immunity, it's a creature of case law, at least in Illinois, and it essentially says you can't sue us for acting in our role as a GAL. This not only includes lawsuits filed by angry parents, but also the children we advocate for. I'm gonna circle back to that momentarily, but it's important to know why we have this policy. And I, I kind of get it. If you hire a lawyer, they mess up your case, you should be able to sue them for legal malpractice. And if a GAL isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, well, shouldn't there be some way to hold them, or by extension me, accountable as well? And that's a very fair point, but the policy reasons for immunity well, they're best explained in this exceptionally cringy TikTok. Call me, call me. Let me know you 
But bottom line, if we lifted immunity, it wouldn't take an angry mom or dad very long to figure out that all they have to do is just threaten a lawsuit and they'll use that as leverage to alter our recommendations. Now make no mistake, despite this immunity, we still get sued because it happened to me twice. But, and there's always a but, it's not a $70,000 problem, which is the average cost to defend a legal malpractice suit in Oklahoma. Now I wasn't able to find the ISBA Mutuals article on this, but my recollection was that their average defense cost runs $27,000. Either way, it's a lot of money. But with GAL immunity, the cost is closer to just maybe a couple thousand for our malpractice insurance to file a motion to dismiss. And the reason why immunity gets this huge discount is those dismissals are filed at the onset of litigation. By stripping immunity, however, the lawsuit would then advance to the discovery stage. At that point, the cost, well, it explodes, which hits our malpractice premiums and it becomes too risky to be a GAL unless you're charging like $2,000 an hour. And that's why as a matter of policy, stripping immunity would probably end the GAL system altogether. Now for the two lawsuits against me, both were of course thrown out. One was done sua sponte by the federal court, the other because my attorney filed, well, you guess it, a motion dismissed. Now no surprise, the other side appealed and the dismissal was affirmed in a Rule 23 order. By the way, a special thanks to Nick Niles of Kirkland and Ellis they all did an incredible job and I, I can't thank them enough. Now you've heard me yak about why we need this immunity, but let's not pretend we all kind of walk around town with these giant halos around our head. For my attorney audience, let me ask you this. How many of you had a GAL who never met with their client or that you felt kind of sleepwalked through the case or otherwise did less than the bare minimum? You know, when I was doing trial work about 95% of the time, the GALs did a wonderful job, even if they didn't agree with my client, but there's still that 5%. And this law review article, well, it argues GALs need standards. And the provocative title comes from the author's personal experience and frustration where the guard Lino never met with the client until very late in the case, but had made recommendations prior to that. Now, circling back to that Illinois Supreme Court case, the allegation was the GAL did nothing. I mean, never met with the client, never did any investigation, and meanwhile, the mom went out and spent tens of thousands of dollars that was earmarked for the child and the presumption was had the GAL done anything, it would have been caught and the money would have been preserved. Now the Illinois Supreme Court stated that even if this extraordinary allegation was true, the immunity still stands because the child isn't technically our client. We merely advocate for their best interests. Personally, I feel we need some middle ground here, some machination that allows a party to quickly bring to the court's attention issues with the garment litem, but without creating a vehicle that angry parents would abuse in order to influence their case. Now, the ISBA is rumored to be changing the GAL statute this year, so perhaps that will add some clarity to the situation but I guess we'll have to see. Anyways, thanks for dropping by this channel. For me, it's kind of a fun way to mix my video hobby with my appellate practice. If you want to see more of these, well, there you go. And thanks for watching.